In this video, we'll see how to use function calls, how to use the x86 string instructions, and how to comply better with the Unix scheme of buffered input and output. I wrote a program, 5STRA, that deals with input and output. It's nothing special, but it provides a setting for us to talk about those topics. We run the program, and it wants some input. The input is a stream of characters, a sequence of words with spaces between them. We enter a pair of words with spaces before and after, and the program repeats them with dots in between. We enter another pair of words, and now it appears that each pair we enter is printed with the first word all the way to the left, and with the second word all the way to the right of a row of 32 characters. The program has to find input words, skip input spaces, and print the correct number of dots. Let's see how that's done in the program. I copied the ELF header from before, and I enlarged the memory size of the segment to cover everything below 8000000 Big Endian. We don't need so much memory, but I want to update this number for the last time. According to the ABI supplement 386, 8000000 is where process segments end and dynamic segments begin. Buffers for input and output are located shortly after the program. We start with a syscall read. The input buffer is an arbitrary size, 256 bytes. Here we write the dots. We don't yet know the correct number of dots, but we don't really need to know. For each line of output, we construct the string in an output buffer, and then invoke a syscall write. We can write 32 dots now, and later write words over them. To write 32 dots, there's an x86 instruction, rep store string. When rep store string runs, it finds in register ECX the number of instances of a byte to write, in register AL the byte to be written, and in register EDI the address of the buffer where bytes are to be written. The store string operation, really an instruction in itself even without the rep prefix, automatically increments EDI afterward, so the dots are written to the address contained in EDI, EDI plus 1, EDI plus 2, and so on. Or rather, EDI is incremented if the direction flag is set to 0. If the direction flag is set to 1, EDI is decremented instead. This instruction, CLD, clears the direction flag, setting it to 0. We don't need to clear the direction flag the first time through, as the direction flag is already clear when our process begins. But later in this program, we set the direction flag to 1 and jump back to the top. So somewhere we need to clear the direction flag. We might as well do it here. Rep, short for repeat, is just a prefix, not an instruction in itself. Each prefix byte rep is combined with one of five string instructions, store, move, load, input, or output. Prefix rep provides a loop, and register ECX keeps count of times left to go through the loop. So after this instruction, rep store string, dots have been written at EDI, EDI plus 1, and so on, up to and excluding EDI plus 20. Now that EDI is pointing to the end of the row, we write a new line character there. We want to write the first word at the beginning of the output buffer, so we subtract 20 from EDI. And we set AL to space, as the coming string operations deal with spaces rather than dots. Next we go through the input buffer, skipping spaces until we find the beginning of the first word. There is an x86 instruction, repi scan string. Prefix repi, or repeat while equal, does the same thing as rep, providing a loop that ends after register ECX counts down to zero. And repi provides another way to end, which I will get to in just a second. The scan string instruction compares the byte at EDI to the byte in AL, then increments or decrements EDI as before. Repi scan string continues while the bytes are equal. That is, the other way for the loop to end is when the byte at EDI and the byte in AL are unequal. We want repi scan string to end on a non-space rather than when ECX reaches zero. So we set ECX to some value far from zero. FF will do. Scan string is designed to use EDI as a pointer, but our program uses ESI as the input pointer. So in order to skip spaces in the input, we swap ESI and EDI before and after the operation. We explicitly decrement EDI to undo the increment of EDI that occurs after the comparison of unequal bytes. 
After this correction, EDI points to the first non-space, and after the swap, ESI has been augmented by the number S01 of leading spaces. The next task is to measure the first word for length. There's an x86 instruction called repni scan string. Prefix repni, or repeat while not equal, is like prefix repi, except that it ends on equality rather than inequality. Prefixes repi and repni can be combined with string instructions scan or compare. We want to stop scanning when the first character is a space. After this block of code, ECX contains the length T1 of the first word. Think S for space, T for token. We copy the first word from the input buffer to the output buffer. There is an x86 instruction rep move string that copies a string of length ECX with ESI as source pointer and EDI as destination pointer. Both ESI and EDI are greater by T1 afterward. We skip the spaces between the first and second words, again with repi scan string. We measure the second word, again with repni scan string, but this time we leave ESI pointing to the end of the second word. Unlike the first word, we will copy the second word right to left. ESI is one past the end of the word until we decrement it. The rightmost position in the row is obuf plus 1f. We set the direction flag to 1, indicating reverse direction, so that ESI and EDI are decremented with each pass through the rep loop. One more rep move string to copy the second word. We invoke syscall write to send the row from the output buffer to the standard output stream, and we jump back to the top of the program. That's the whole program. All the string instructions used here deal with one byte at a time, but there are variants in the instruction set that deal with four byte integers and some other sizes. The various sizes are discussed along with the string instructions in the Intel manual. Looking at this program, either in the machine instructions or in the comments, we see some similarity in how the two input words are handled. Skip space one and skip space two are the same, and word len one and word len two are almost the same. You can see the whole text of program 5STRA if you like. A link is in the description. I'm making a copy 5strb.dmp. We fuse together skip space 1 and word len 1. Let's call the new block scan word 1. We delete redundant swaps, saving a few bytes. And the same for skip space 2 and word len 2. Now we see two nearly identical blocks next to one another, or two identical blocks nearly next to one another. Perhaps with some work we can turn this into a proper loop, but I prefer to define a function. The idea is to keep just one copy of the redundant code and jump in and out of it as desired. We put a copy of the block apart from the main program. Such a block is known as a function, procedure, routine, or subroutine. We replace each instance of the block in the main program by a reference to the function, known as a function call. The code that implements the function call, or the place in the program where a function call is made, can be thought of as a caller. The jump instructions enable us to redirect the stream of execution elsewhere in the program, say to the beginning of a block. At the end of that block, we may place another jump instruction to jump back to the caller. However, a function may have many colors, and we need to know which color to jump back to. So we should store some information about the color before we jump. It turns out that there are special x86 instructions to facilitate this. We don't jump to a function, we call a function. Call stores information about the caller and jumps to the designated function. Ret, short for return, retrieves the stored information and jumps back to the caller. The new program is 7 bytes shorter thanks to this function, 18 bytes shorter due to the removal of duplicate code, 1 byte longer due to a return instruction, and 10 bytes longer due to two function calls. I repair all the byte counts, jump lengths, and file size, I make the binary, and it runs.
but it has flaws. It doesn't quit when the input is done, as cat does, for example. So control D doesn't stop the process. I killed it with control C. If we neglect to put at least one space after the second word, the new line is taken as part of the second word, as the program looks only for the space character, not for other white space like tabs or new lines. If we feed input into the program by a pipe rather than by typing it into the terminal, the second line is never used. We should pay closer attention to syscall read. Read attempts to read up to count bytes, and read returns the number of bytes actually available. Zero is returned when no more bytes are available. Negative one is returned on error. The number of bytes actually available may be smaller than count if we're reading from a terminal. When we type input into the terminal, the system waits for us to type a line, then it finishes the syscall. But when the input is piped in, in this example, the whole input is smaller than the count of the read syscall. So both lines are read in one syscall read, and then our program stops processing input after the second word. When we jump back to the top of the loop, the syscall read has no new bytes for us, but this program does not detect that condition. The old bytes are still in our program's input buffer, and they are reused. Let's revise our program to handle later word pairs in the piped case as well as in the typed case. While we're at it, let's see the manual on syscall write. Write writes up to count bytes, not necessarily count bytes. The write call may be interrupted by a signal handler. Negative one is returned on error. My new program, 5STRC, deals with these problems. It recognizes more characters as white space, detects some error conditions in the syscalls, works equally well with input from a terminal or from a pipe, and persists with write in case not all the bytes were written. The new program is longer than the others, but not much longer. Let's take a look. Register EBP contains the number of bytes in the input buffer not yet processed by our program. When the program starts up, no bytes are available, and EBP is zero. We begin a loop where each time through, we construct a line of output. Again, we start by filling the output row with 32 dots using rep store string. Afterward, we rewind EDI to the beginning of the output buffer, where the first word belongs. We call function word, which gets the next word from the input and copies it into place at EDI. We advance EDI past the row of dots, and call function word again. This is not exactly where the second word belongs, but as we read the word left to right, we don't know where it belongs until we've read the whole thing. Our solution is to move the second word to a known place within the output buffer, but outside the row to be printed, and then to move the second word into place after we know its length. EAX and ECX get the address of the end of the row. That's also where the temporary copy of the second string begins. After function word runs, EDI has been augmented by the length of the word. So when we subtract ECX from EDI, EDI has the length of the second word. There is coming up an instruction rep move string, and we want ECX to contain that length. So we swap ECX and EDI, then subtract ECX from EDI to make EDI the correct place where the second string begins. In this program, we're using the forward direction only in the string instructions. For rep move string, ESI needs to be at the beginning of the word. During the execution of rep move string, we need to save the value of ESI, as ESI has the important role in our program of input pointer. We swap EAX and ESI so that EAX saves ESI. Now ESI points to the beginning of the second word in its temporary location. After rep move string, we restore the value of ESI by swapping it again with EAX. We write a new line at the end of the buffer and invoke syscall write. If the syscall returns a negative number, we jump to an error handling routine. Otherwise, we advance the buffer and shrink the count. We loop back to flush while bytes remain to be written. After all bytes are written, we loop back to line. Function word starts by getting a byte from input. Function getByte is responsible to arrange that ESI points to the next input byte. 
In ASCII, white space characters like space, tab, and new line come before letters or numbers, so a single comparison is enough. While the character is white space, we skip characters. Once we reach a non-space character, we transfer characters byte by byte from place ESI to place EDI. This one byte instruction, the move string instruction, copies a character and increments ESI and EDI. Until the character is white space, we loop back. Finally, we return from function word. There are actually two functions, getByte and getByte1, the difference being that getByte first increments ESI. GetByte is the normal entry point, as the input pointer should advance. But here in function word, a side effect of instruction move string is to increment ESI. We could undo the side effect by decrementing ESI before we call getByte, but it's cheaper to define this alternate function getByte1. In getByte, we increment ESI and decrement EBP, the count of saved input bytes. This count includes the current byte, so if the count has reached zero, it's time to refill the input buffer by invoking syscall read. We examine the return value EAX for error or end of input. Otherwise, we proceed to set the input pointer to the beginning of the input buffer, and to set EBP to the number of bytes just returned by syscall read. And we return from the function. Here are the error and exit routines. If the program exits with a write error, the exit status is 2. If the program exits with a read error, the exit status is 1. Else the program exits with status 0. And that's it for program 5STRC. One more thing about 5STRC. The program reads many bytes of input per syscall read, and yet we implement this function getByte to provide one byte at a time. It's tempting to think that we might simplify the program by always requesting just one byte per syscall read. What's holding us back from eliminating the input buffer and asking for one byte at a time? Well, the word on the street is that invoking a system call by the x86 interrupt instruction is slow. If that's true, that each interrupt is costly, even when reading just a few bytes, and our program spends most of its time waiting for interrupts to be handled, then eliminating the input buffer could really slow down our program. We're in a good position to test that. Here's a command that generates a million input pairs for 5STRC. Here's what the output looks like. And here's how long it takes to generate the million pairs, process them with 5STRC, and count the lines, words, and bytes of output. That's if we read 256 bytes per syscall read. If we shrink that to 64 bytes per syscall read, then it takes a little longer. 16. 4, and 1. Apparently, we do save a lot of time by asking for many bytes in each syscall read. That's it for functions and strings. We still have the problem of computing byte counts and jump lengths. It's tedious. I will present a solution, perhaps not in the next video, but in the one after that.